This is Death Metal Chronicles episode number 12. Uh, today we have some different uh, commentary on the Unsung Heroes of War um, section. Um, I had a friend uh, who will remain nameless. Uh, here's this story. So once upon a time in Iraq, we were babysitting some of the intel guys. Welcome to Death Metal Chronicles episode number 12. First off, I want to thank all the, uh, the viewers who have uh, subscribed to us and uh, have uh, given in your stories and comments and things. For the Unsung Heroes of War section um, segment, I have some uh, I have an interesting story. So here it goes. Once upon a time in Iraq, the Intel guys were getting scoped by my 300 Winchester because they were off doing their thing and ended up, uh, I guess, in the front of a. Uh, some guys watching over him, so <laughs> probably in the wrong AO. <laughs> he didn't further on that story. <laughs> the most funniest story is that one day um, deployed, uh, he made a uh, 550 cord uh, and 100 mile an hour duct, uh, duct tape two piece bikini thing for the J-2 NCO chick in military intelligence that was, quote, a hottie. She never wore it, he says. She never wore it, although I challenged her to mud wrestling contests the next time it rained in Iraq. No go. Unfortunately, I was proud of my creation, though. OD green, very skimpy, Dorito chip shape, X on the top, X1 below thong in the back. The division command sergeant major, Charlie Corp, Thorpe, Charlie Thorpe, ended up saluting himself in a Humvee mirror. <laughs> the uh, military intelligence war uh, warrant chicks washing their hair in the desert with four to five liters of water while we were on a one liter bottle per day ration. Sergeant Majors on the John Deere Gators. <laughs> our supply sergeant getting getting lost going from our tent to the perimeter to guard at night. Inside the perimeter. <laughs> the TM 82nd RSAD getting pinned down on infill and calling QRF, enemy ended up being one old lady with a bolt-action Mauser. <laughs> and nuking the shit out of an unoccupied sandbar in the in Euphrates River one night with 155 arty and uh, 200 pounders from a cast as a show of force. <laughs> And one day, surveilling target villages for days on end from afar, seeing nothing but old men railing little boys in the pooper out in the fields, and chicks dropping deuces outside the village, unaware of our presence. One day, we were at Bagram Airfield, and two dudes got arrested for banging chicks in their vehicles, also charged with carrying a concealed weapon in a boot. In a freaking combat zone. Concealed weapon. What the fuck? Another time, our ranger buddy, hitchhiking a ride home solo across the Iraq and Kuwait border for the birth of my son, nothing but a duffel bag and a letter of release from theater. Dudes at the fob gates looked dumbfounded as I entered their ECP from the open wide desert in some random contractor's truck. How did you get out here? Don't worry about it. Let me in. 
Oh, the beauty. <laughs> so that was our uh, stories section of the end song. Uh, here's War. If you want your uh, stories in there, shoot them my way. I'll throw them out there. However you write them, I read them. So. For uh, some actual news, uh, today, I, uh, a couple of days ago, I had found on uh, the Washington Post um, by the Federal Diary with Joe Davidson, Congress focusing on significant changes to federal security clearance process. The outbreak of, com of comedy? Com committee? Com it's supposed to be committee. This guy's, I don't know. In the uh, House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, often a sharply partisan place means the government security clearance process is in for significant changes. Democrats and Republicans on the committee are united by an urgency to fix the system that was not able to stop Aaron Alexis's September rampage. He was a defense contractor with a security clearance who attacked the Washington Navy Yard workplace, killing 12 before being shot to death by the police. The committee members and their colleagues in Congress decide could have major impacts on the nearly 5 million employees and contractors who are eligible for security clearances. Areas of agreement in principle, if not, de not detail, include the continuous monitoring of security clearance holders through database databases, securing better cooperation from local law enforcement, and greater use of social media in background investigations. <laughs> Gosh, such propaganda. The bipartisan desire to fix the system, however, does not extend to all remedies or even diagnoses. Republicans object to taking security clearance checks from private contractors who now do 70% of that work, returning it to the federal investigators. They also tend to focus their criticisms on government rather than private contractors, including a big one facing serious Justice Department allegations for ailments in the system. No matter who does the investigations, Republicans and Democrats think employees should be checked more often. Cleared individuals now go years, perhaps too many, without a security reevaluation. Those with secret clearance, like Alexis, were reinvestigated every 10 years. It's five years for top secret holders. Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton, a Democrat of D.C., said she can't understand how Alexis could have a security clearance that enabled him to go through 10 years without a review. And she probably only has a secret, and she only goes through it every 10 years? Question mark? <laughs> Doesn't say what she's a part of. Even the most stable person has incidents in his life that in a decade could affect his ability to handle Uncle Sam's secrets, she said. This is from Eleanor Holmes Norton. Where did the 10-year period come from? She asked witnesses during the committee hearing last week. Office of Personal Management Director Catherine Archuleta, OPM Inspector General Patrick McFarland, and Stephen Lewis, a Deputy Director in the Department of Defense, had no answer. OPM oversees the background check program, Lewis said, and the 10-year reevaluation will move to a five-year recurring review and we do believe that continuous evaluation, ongoing reviews of available records, should occur as well. I like how these people are not actually elected and just deciding these things. It's very interesting, seeing that they're just appointed. No one will probably ever mention that. Republicans praised Norton's excellent line of questioning. Discussion related to legislation introduced by Representative Stephen F. Lynch, Democrat of Massachusetts, was also an example of cross-aisle cooperation. Lynch proposes withholding federal funds from local police agencies that do not fully cooperate with federal background investigators. What? The Republican chairman, Representative Darrell Issa of California, said the committee has been working on a completely bipartisan basis toward legislation that includes some of Lynch's provisions. Bipartisanship has limits. Democrats want government employees to do greater share of the background checks. Because of the allegations of corruption and security clearance contracting, it is imperative that we bring the key background investigative work back to the federal government, Lynch said. 
my legislation will ensure the federal employees, rather than outside contractors, perform critical investigative functions, including top secret clearance level investigations. So, I'm not exactly sure if I'm allowed to mention the names, but I will say this. If you look online and then you find out who are the contractors that are actually investigating um, clearances, you will find out there are four or five different companies, and the requirements are that they were, in the past couple of years, the past, I think, year, two years, they had to have actually gone to the same school, the OPM investigator school, to investigate clearances. So you may or may not have a clearance, and you probably have never actually even met a uh, government employee. Why? Because it's cheaper to have a guy get paid $30 an hour to go do background investigations and fly around the world than some guy who is a government employee who's like a GS-7 or 12 who then just refuses to go fly somewhere when he needs to and then pushes it off to the people that are local. What this person also isn't saying is the fact that these aren't just outside people. The requirement within that position is that you actually have to have a top secret clearance with SCI and above. I mean, you have to go into some pretty hardcore databases. So it's not like these are just random people. These are people who have jobs that have had a regular GS government salaried um, investigator position with OPM. So that's, I mean, maybe the admin people or something like that, but they don't even handle the information. Now, I, I guess this person, this lynch guy, is kind of going around about saying, oh, well, the government will do it better. Neither of them are doing better. The contractor is just as open to deception and to fraud as the government employee. But essentially, they're the same thing because they have the same uh, ID cards, they have the same badge, they're sworn federal federal contractor employees, which really, essentially, they're not really an employee of of a company, even though they may get paid by one. This guy, Lynch, is misinforming people and making people think that they're outsiders or something. They're inside the process because they do the process. They are the process. A Democratic staff report issued by Republican Elijah Cummings, Democrat from Maryland, said Congress also should reconsider the extent to which outsourcing critical investigative functions may impact national security? Having federal law enforcement personnel do all the checks could improve the cooperation needed from local police officials. These are just random statements. I'm so confused. As a report issued by Easton Notes, more than 450 local enforcement agencies do not cooperate fully with security clearance investigators. Unfortunately, some of the country's largest local law enforcement agencies are on the list, says Republican staff report. The Newark Police Department is on the list with a note that says, will not fulfill any requests other than for law enforcement agencies. Newark Police did not respond to request for comment. Well, actually, they are kind of right, because they're not law enforcement. Although it is a crime to lie to an investigator, they are not law enforcement. A D.C. spokesman, spokeswoman told my colleague Ernesto Longdonao, Doniano, Don, Doniano, that city law prohibits police from sharing law enforcement information with civilians. At the hearing, however, Archuleta said D.C. police recently agreed to provide information to investigators. The lack of cooperation cited in Issa's report does not convince him that federal employees should do all the checks. I want to be a little careful not to rush to bring everything in-house, said, when in fact we're not very good in the federal government at increasing or reducing workloads, as easily as private companies can. Yeah, like I said, this ESA guy is kind of correct in that, in the sense that um, it's easy. I mean, these are contract positions. They can fire them or um, replace them at any time, and it maintains the workflow. Um, so you can just bring in new people. You don't have to have a civil service thing. But they are civil service because they still have to go through the uh, school, even if you hired a new employee. Um, but the reputation of private companies has been damaged. Cummings' report focused on USIS, which is actually one of the companies, uh, U.S. Investiga- Investigation Service, a false church firm facing Justice Department allegations that it failed 
to do required quality control reviews. USIS is about half of the government's background probes, including the one on Alexis. About 40% of its work over the period of more than four years is in question. As part of OPM's reform efforts, Archuleta announced this month that private companies will no longer do their own quality control reviews, noting that he was not employed by USIS during the period under scrutiny. Sterling Phillips, a firm's chief executive since January 2013, tried to minimize the allegations, saying they relate to a small group of individuals over a specific time period that are inconsistent with our values and strong record for customer service. <laughs> I need to learn how to speak like that. But it's a big deal to the Justice Department and to the Congress. Justice is seeking more than $1 billion from uses, claiming that the company charged taxpayers for work it never performed on ladies and gentlemen. Listen to this, 665,000 background investigations from 2008 to 2012. Cummings told the hearing. I actually like to read some of these uh, comments. Neither side is dealing with the truly... This is from some guy named... Not the droid. These are not the contractors you were looking for. <laughs> These are not the droids you were looking for. <sighs> Neither side is dealing with the truly ludicrous amount of overclassification that's become part of the government's culture. They really need to curb classification in large measures to start with, but the inaction in dealing with that issue has become badly entrenched. He hit the nail on the head. Number one... When in doubt, use stamp secret on it. There's a reason the military and the government does this in general, because you don't want to underclassify something. You can always overclassify something, and oh yeah, we'll take care of it, you know. And in a past episode, I actually named the the people that do the classification. Right, no one really knew. Um, so there's actually a group of people that do the uh, the classification process, and this guy's right. Um, there's a lot of things that don't need to be classified, and there may actually be a lot of things that do need to be classified that are not. Another comment, uh, 1.4 million Americans have top secret clearance. Nearly 1% of the entire U.S. workforce. Another 5 million Americans have merely secret. One out of every 30 American workers. If we have classified so much, it is an immense cleared workforce is needed, and we are definitely over-classifying. And if over 5 million people know a secret, is it even a secret anymore? It's a good comment. Some guy named Publius38. Even in their zeal to reform the clearance process, it seems the Republicans simply cannot get past their hatred of the government to perform what is an inherently government action to vet access to government secrets. Probably too many pro government contractors among their campaign donors. I'll let that slide. You guys can comment on that. Yeah, tell me what you guys think on uh, under overclassification. What things could be changed? Um, I don't exactly have a a good idea on that one, but it is something that's needed. And in the military times, Kerry accuses Assad of stonewalling in peace talks. Jakarta, Indonesia, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry on Monday accused Syrian President Bashar Assad of stonewalling in peace talks and called on Russia to push its ally to negotiate with opposition leaders. Why are we still dealing with Syria? Why don't we just leave it alone? Just let them implode. Who cares? They have a thousand other people that are around them that could blow them up or give them money. I don't care. It's so stupid. It's not even worth a, a printed newspaper who gives a shit about Syria. Right now, Bashir al-Assad is not engaged in discussions along the promised and required standard that both Russia spoke up for and the regime spoke up for, Kerry said during a press conference in Jakarta with Indonesian Foreign Minister Marty Natalagawa. Not Natalagawa? He said Assad's team refused to open up one moment of discussion 
of transitional government to replace the Shah's regime. Ah, uh, I don't know much about that. I wonder if they were actually elected. You can't just call it a regime. I mean, who cares, really? I mean... <laughs> Bashar al-Assad is the president of Syria. Oh, he's part of the Ba'ath Party. Okay, uh, interesting. Certain president since 2000, when he succeeded his father, who left Syria 30 years ago until his death. Al-Assad graduated from the school of Damascus University in 1988, worked as a physician in the army four years later, attended the postgraduate Western Eye Hospital in London, specializing in ophthalmology in 1994. The People's Council of Syria in 2000 and 2007, and he... political party, the Syrian regional branch of the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party. This is according to Wiki. I don't know. It is very clear that Bashar Assad is trying to win this on the battlefield instead of coming to the negotiating table in good faith, Kerry said. Peace talks last week in Geneva ended with no progress toward breaking the impasse in nearly three rolled conflict in Syria. Kerry, who called Syria a tragedy to the world, also had harsh words for Assad's allies in Moscow. Russia needs to be part of the solution, not contributing so many more weapons and so much more aid that they are in fact enabling Assad to double down, which is creating an enormous problem. Turn that around, if you would. Who is America enabling? <laughs> I'm fairly certain that America is enabling uh, Syria as well. Russia has told the U.S. it is committed to help create a transitional government, Kerry said, but has not delivered. The kind of effort to create the kind of dynamic by which it could be achieved. I'm not going to go through the rest of this. You guys can read it. It's on Military Times. I figure it's kind of interesting. I say get all of our people out of Syria. That's my opinion. One American is too much to waste on a shithole like that. That's my opinion. Not one dollar, not one word, not one whatever. So I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, Valerie Plame came out with her, uh, came out with a statement, uh, Edward Snowden deserves thanks. And, uh... Clapper should... Uh, James Clapper should resign. Um, former CIA agent Valerie Plame Wilson said Wednesday that she views the NSA leaker Edward Snowden as neither a hero nor a traitor, but that Americans should be grateful he brought the conversation about liberty and security to the national forefront. This is on the Huffington post. Plame also rolled her eyes at Cheney la labeling Snowden a traitor, given the Bush's administration involvement in leaking her identity to columnist Robert Novak. Oh, yeah. Um, any person that was involved in that should be in jail right now. No question. That's not even... You, you cannot use uh, politics to out someone who is a government employee. Um... And whatever they're doing, doesn't really matter what they're doing. If they're employed by the government, and another government employee, doesn't matter what they are, has uh, outed someone in their employment, especially if it's, you know, there's the whole thing in the, um, it's an executive order um, for people that have clandestine work, and if you out that person, you should go to jail immediately. I 
Cheney and whoever else is involved in that should, uh, yeah. The irony of people like Dick Cheney or Karl Rove, Valerie Plain said, whining and bemoaning the fact of the League of Intelligence, given my history and certainly Dick Cheney's intimate involvement with the betrayal of my CIA identity, is really something, she said. Plain called for the resignation of the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, saying that, as a former intelligence officer, she finds it astounding that the upwards of 60-70% to 70 of the U United States intelligence budget is spent on private contractors. Interesting. I don't know why she would say that, but... Uh, one question might be, why hasn't the DNI clapper resigned? He is ultimately responsible for the safeguarding of these secrets, she said. As if the secrets would be hidden if they were government employees, but we'll let her go on with that. How do you propose to keep the secrets if you have that high of a contracting force? Where is their loyalty? Well, you're hiring Americans getting paid with American money through American companies, so it's not necessarily going to be their country to the United States. It's going to be the person writing their paycheck. That's how everybody feels about working directly for the government, too, so I don't... I'm not following her on that, but... <laughs> Plame said that she has great respect for journalist Glenn Greenwald, who broke the Snowden story, saying, He has written eloquently for years on this issue in a very serious, sustained manner. She added that she believes the conversation should focus less on Snowden and more on the questions he raised, since his fate is already foregone. He will be abused, he will be punished, Plain said of Snowden. Perhaps he could have done it in a different way, but that's not the conversation we should be having. Yeah, I would actually read a lot of the comments um, you get some very interesting views um, on this article. Um, for, against, in the middle. Um, you get some tinfoil hat people. You get some interesting, different stuff. Um, here we go. Libert this one guy, Daniel F. Uh, I'll read his thing, this is interesting. So, after reading hundreds of posts by libertarian extremists on this blog, not one has explained how they would prevent another massive attack if the NSA programs were eliminated. Just a bunch of self-glorifying, narcissistic blather about how precious their email privacy is and their made-up fear about how Big Brother is watching their every move. No wonder these programs are here to stay. Libertarians have no valid argument to stop them. I think this guy is referring to the other commenters within the post, um, on Huffing Huffington Post. Um, there is an answer, and us libertarians are very solid on defense. Uh, I'm not for conscription at all. I say, um, I like the concept of Switzerland. I like the, the idea of do whatever the hell you want. Uh, as long as you're not hurting anybody, not using the, the, the libertarianism we talk about the non-aggression principle. The non-aggression principle means you can, as Mr. Mr. Block, Walter Block would say, uh, you can do anything as you damn well please as long as you keep your mitts to yourself. If you keep your mitts to yourself, sweet. If you don't, you know, that's where uh, things come a knocking. So, in the same sense of... Um, I, mean, I guess this guy is saying there's no al valid argument to stop them. Well, there is nothing that would stop a person from giving up secrets other than what's inside of their heart. So, if their allegiance, no matter if they've signed all these documents, if they're working for a government contractor, or they're working for the government as a direct employee, or they were voted by Democratic popular vote, and then they out people who are in the CIA. The problem is not necessarily that libertarians are not offering a decent argument to change things. Yes, your email privacy is yours. With this Daniel F. guy, USA Patriot 2012, uh, I guess he was speaking to that guy, is basically saying that your person's papers and effects are not your own. 
Well, they are your own. You're, you own them. You own your thoughts. You own your words. You you own what is inherently yours by your moral ownership of yourself. So if you believe that you own your body, then you own your words and you own your emails and you own your private thoughts to yourself. There is no reason that anybody needs to be uh, listening in on an American citizen or in collusion with another government listening in on American citizens. That's even more reprehensible. Um, as Mr. Snowden has released, um, the GCHQ is outright listening in on American citizens. Well, if there are allies, why are they listening to American citizens? And also, why are the elected officials allowing them to do that? Well, they're government cronies and they're doing their thing to get more money. Uh, why wouldn't they? So they set up some program with London and GCHQ. They set up um, apparatuses to collect all that information. Any, any American that goes through that country then is being surveilled and counterintelligence is put on them. So, of, of the people from, from Britain. So, you know, this whole idea that libertarians don't have a valid argument to stop what's going on. Actually, yes, we do. And it's stop listening to our emails, or stop listening to our phone call conversations, stop reading our emails, stop surveilling us, um, and just do what's right, you know? Um, if you're a citizen, you have innate rights in this country. Our rights either come from your creator or they come from your humanity, one or the other. Just because Obama says that you should be killed and he has a kill list, doesn't mean that it's morally right. So essentially it's the same idea, the same concept. Your email privacy is tied into you being scoped and smoke-checked in Pakistan just because you're maybe doing wrong. I'm not saying that SF shouldn't go out there and black bag you and interrogate you for what you're doing and then convict you in a federal court. What I am saying is that you should be using a uh, drone to just go smoke-check a bunch of American citizens because they may or may not be doing wrong. That's not justified. There's nowhere in the Constitution that ever even mentions that the president has the ability to kill anyone. He is the commander-in-chief of the military and of nothing else. Um, ah, just makes me angry. So that was in the news a couple of days ago. on uh, the Huffington Post. thought it was fairly interesting and a good read. Um, I'm really following Valerie Plame because she's out there fighting the good fight and speaking out as much as she can um, in ways that a lot of us are not able to. So, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> when in doubt, check out the Military Times. Amos breaks silence on scout sniper scandal. I never said that I wanted them crushed. Skull Crusher Amos. <laughs> Taking them on and licking them good. The Marine Corps top general has ended his silence on accusations. He abused his authority to ensure Marines were punished for their inappropriate war zone video, vehemently denying in the interview with NPR that he told the subordinate general he wanted those embroiled in the scandal crushed and kicked out of their service. Marine Corps Commandant General Jim Amos, the Skull Crusher, <laughs> spoke to René Mon Montage of NPR's Morning Edition during his visit to L.A. last weekend. During the interview, which aired Monday, Amos was asked about his involvement in legal proceedings stemming from the YouTube video, which shows four Marine scout snipers urinating on enemy corpses in Afghanistan. <laughs> That led to a cascade of accusations, Montage said in the, in the interview. The main one in the beginning was that you used your influence as the top general unlawfully. After a brief silence, Amos said, I have never, I have never, ever said that I wanted them crushed or kicked out. I don't recall at all saying that. What I do recall is that there was some motivation on my part, without getting to exact matters of the meeting, that I questioned some early decisions by the commander. Once I left the meeting, I went, okay, that probably wasn't the right thing to do, as he relates <laughs> to what we call undue command influence. That commander was Lieutenant General Thomas Waldhauser, whom in January 2012, Amos appointed to oversee the Marine Corps 
prosecution of those connected to the urination video. Amos removed Wallhauser from that role about a month later, immediately after their meeting, and gave the job to another three-star general to eliminate any bearing the Commandant's comments may have had on Wallhauser's handling, handling of the cases, Amos told NPR. And then I stayed out of it completely, he added. <laughs> I'm bringing... As Marine Corps Times first reported last summer, Walt Hazard provided a sworn statement to the defense attorneys for the two Marines who were disciplined for the video. In the statement, Walt Hazard said that during the meeting, Amos told him he wanted the offenders crushed and discharged from the Marine Corps when this was all over. When Walhauser pushed back, according to his sworn statement, Amos said that he could remove Walhauser from the case and later directed the Marine Corps assistant commandant to deliver news that he was going to do exactly that. Montage asked Amos whether Walhouse may have gotten the impression that he was removed from questioning the commandant. I've kept my mouth shut for f- for a year and a half, and I think that's absolutely suspicious. Spacious? Absolutely spacious, Amos replied. I mean, I can't, I can't speak for him, but I can speak for myself. <laughs> so Amos speaks, I guess. <laughs> All the Marines embroiled in the urination scandal. We're treated justly, Amos said, with some accepting NJPs, non-judicial punishments, and other receiving a demotion in rank at court proceedings. Amos said that he couldn't remember if any had been discharged because of the incident. Couldn't remember. <laughs> yeah, right. Of the eight Marines punished in the relation to the scandal, only one faces the prospect of involuntary discharge. Captain James Clement, who was uh, recommended for separation in his current rank at a board of inquiry hearing last fall for failing to supervise Marines on a patrol. He is appealing the decision. Fuck yeah, he should. Tell guys to go out and do something, they fuck shit up, they blow shit up. Fuck it. He may be their command, but he can't command their cocks for not pissing on bad guys. (laughs) Certainly none of them have been crushed or thrown out of the Marine Corps, Amos said. And that's an important point. Obviously, since General Amos Skull Crusher hasn't skull fucked anyone, I guess uh, <laughs> everything's a okay. The allegations surrounding Amos surfaced last May after a Marine attorney working for Walt Hazard Replacement filed a complaint with the Department of Defense Inspector General in his complaint. Major James Warrick accused Amos and his legal advisors of exercising unlawful command influence in transferring the sniper case from Waldhauser to Warrick's boss at the time, Lieutenant General Mills. The Commandant's decision to reassign the urination cases (laughs) was not explained publicly before Waldhauser's sworn statement emerged in July. Two months prior to the source within the Commandant's office, told Marine Corps Times that Waldhauser was removed because of his future roles as the Defense Secretary's top military advisor was of supreme importance and he needed time to prepare. That explanation proved untrue. And it just keeps going on and on and on. There's no comments about the urination video. There should be. Because when the skull crusher is involved, you gotta you gotta speak up. Speak out. We can't have people R. Kelly and people in a war zone. I mean God forbid. Oh, this is interesting. I found this on antiwar.com. Challenger viewpoints. Read all kinds of material. Uh, you might get pissed off at this. You might not. If you do get pissed off at it, go fuck yourself. How the Swiss opted out of war. Switzerland has not been in a foreign war of any kind since 1815, which is not necessarily true. They were in Afghanistan. Astounding, even miraculous for any nation, but Switzerland borders Germany, France, and Italy, and Austria, and Liechtenstein. Now, the Vaduz regime has really lashed out in the Butzreg in desperate bid to rein in Uber allies, but all of Switzerland's other neighbors have spent their histories invading other countries. Very true. 
In addition to encircling form marauders, Switzerland itself is composed of four different language groups, German, French, Italian, and Romanish, that get along as well, Germans and French. The Swiss finalized their no wars policy of armed neutrality in 1815. Their decentralized citizen army was good enough to keep them out of the Franco Prussian War of 1870, World War I, and the European gang fights. In 1934, they addressed the looming threat of aerial bombing by starting a massive civil defense effort. They maintained their civil citizen army and kept out of World War II, even while provoking Hitler by letting the Jews hide their assets in secret Swiss bank accounts. Many Jews only escaped the Holocaust because they had their money where Nazi tax authorities couldn't get it. Hitler was, in fact, very provoked by the Swiss. His generals even got as far as giving the invasion of Switzerland the name Operation Tonnebaum and drawing lines on maps for it. However, no matter how they drew the lines, they couldn't overcome the reality that there were no critical central targets for mechanized blitzrig to disrupt. Every house in Switzerland was a center of the resistance. The Wehrmacht paratroopers couldn't beat a defense that covered every square centimeter of the country with accurate rifle fire, and they knew it. At the end of World War II, some Russian refugees took shelter in Liechtenstein. The Soviets demanded they be returned over to the NKVD, and Liechtenstein blocked them. So occasionally the fury of Liechtenstein is unleashed, after all. While the United States and Britain helped the Soviets herd millions of people into trains to Siberia death camps, the citizens of Liechtenstein and its ally Switzerland faced down Stalin. For that quote, there's actually a link uh, directly to a, a, a book from uh, Nikolai Tolstoy of uh, the story of what they're talking about. In 1962, noticing the Cold War was not getting any safer, the Swiss started building nuclear shelters. By the early 1990s, the program was complete. Every homeschool business in Switzerland has a blast shelter in the basement with a filtered air system. Hospitals have fortified wards, and local governments have underground command centers. Every citizen is trained in civil defense and knows where to find a radiation meter and a gas mask. If the rest of Europe remain, turns itself into glowing rubble, the Swiss will spend two weeks playing cards on the ground and then go back to work. <laughs> All this defensive infrastructure also limits the destructive potential of terrorist attacks. Dirty bombs are useless against people with shelters and fallout meters. Every citizen has anti-chemical weapon masks and equipment. Even nuclear bombs will only kill people in the immediate blast area. Survivors would escape to the shelters. Any attempt to terrorize citizens with Mumbai-style attacks would meet with assault rifles and rocket launchers of every Swiss household. How much does all this security cost the Swiss? Not very much. In the 1980s, the Swiss spent $33 per capita annually on civil defense. <laughs> Since the completion of the shelter program, they spent less. In fact, the Swiss federal government now leaves all civil defense spending to the cantons. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Estimates, cantons would be more like a, uh, a, a county government, essentially, in the states. Estimates put total Swiss military spending at 0.9% of GDP. The U.S. spends 5 to 6%. I'd, I would probably say it's probably more like 50% in America. Of gross domestic product. You can't just take gross domestic product as, as word. You have to add in different things to that as well to get a good view. Uh, much larger GDP to achieve almost total vulnerability. The Swiss solution makes Swiss society more resilient against other natural or man-made disasters as well. A reactor meltdown is trivial to a nation that is built to withstand direct nuclear bombardment. Even asteroid strikes or megavolcanoes are less threatening to a nation, only steps away from shelter and stockpiles. Whatever the future brings, the Swiss people will face it squarely and deal with it. The American way. Permanent war and no defense. As John Huntsman said before dropping out of the primary race, the United States spends about as much as the rest of the world put together on defense. 
our on budget military spending is around 45% of the world's defense expenditure. But then we have a 75 billion black budget, a veterans budget, a veterans affairs budget of 132.2 billion on budget aid on budget foreign aid for 53.3 billion and off budget federal reserve foreign aid and frankly unbelievable amounts they actually have a uh, direct links all the bloomberg and to a uh, reuters and fact checked uh, all of this um so 100 billion here 100 billion there and we end up spending as much as all the world's armies and air forces put together the United States is programmed to address threats that don't even exist. We have the F-35 to face down, now defunct Soviet Air Force, Trident submarines to launch missiles at now friendly Russian cities, and aircraft carriers to fight no one. As no other country is dumb enough to pile $20 billion into one fragile, indefensible missile magnet. He put it, put the words. So we must be pretty safe, right? We must have really good anti-aircraft defense. Oops, no. Even civil air airliners can just fly right into the Pentagon, even with lots of warning time. But we must have missile defense. After all, the money we've spent, not so much. We have around 30 interceptor missiles that protect Alaska and Vanderburg Air Force Base, as long as the enemy promises not to use any decoys or electronic countermeasures. U.S. cities have... Are, U.S. cities are wide open to attack by any nuclear power, including the French. Yes, that is 100% correct. Because no U.S. city right now has anti-aircraft uh, protection. But the only military threat recognized by the mainstream media nowadays is terrorist bombs delivered by Chevy Suburbans of the UPS man. So the United States must have a really well-developed civil defense system to protect citizens against fallout, nerve gas, biological agents. All citizens must be trained, trained in nuclear, biological, and chemical defense and have their radiation meters, masks, protective suits, and their car trunks. Maybe in some alternate universe in the 2012 United States, the only civil defense is whatever people provide for themselves. A trillion dollars or so of defense money is spent mainly on serving as mercenaries to various warlords that we support around the world. Meanwhile, America herself is the most vulnerable target in history. Full of single-point failure modes, glass cities, and panicky homeland security bu bureaucrats. A few guys with box cutters cause us to attack ourselves with security measures that cost us many times the expense of physical damage of the 9-11 attacks. Then we made a follow-up strike on ourselves by launching several wars which cost another $4 trillion or so. That was our response to losing two buildings. A serious terrorist attack wouldn't involve su suicide bombings with hijacked airliners. There'd be more dangerous non-suicide bombings using nerve gas, Ebola, flu, or nuclear bombs. Or bargain basement terrorists could simply make simultaneous conventional explosive attacks on dams at flood stage, refineries and chemical plants during smog weather inversions. The internet backbone, anytime. Americans have to be honest with ourselves if there were a real attack against the United States. Would we bravely handle it with a stiff upper lip and recover? Or would our homeland security apparatus choke the economy of our country to death and panic with crazy travel restrictions, nonsensical strip searches of old women and children? I think the answer is clear. The United States would cease to exist in anything resembling a functional state if even one city were seriously attacked. America could be safer than Switzerland. Switzerland, of course, is a small landlocked among is small, landlocked among other nations with long criminal records, and it has a smaller military budget than any of the potential attackers. The United States has none of these problems. If we applied the Swiss model, we could ensure our society, our constitution, our freedoms, and most of our people could survive even a major attack and if someone thinks you're certain to survive and hunt them down they're less likely to attack in the first place. We have technical advances that the Swiss do not. We could expect our missile defense program 
we could expand our missile defense program and help other powers to do so as well. I don't agree with that. No decent person wants to see the children of Kiev, Mumbai, or Beijing burn a nuclear fire for some politician's agenda. A thin defense shield against rogue missiles for every country that wants it should be encouraged. We could also have real air defense against bombers or drones tomorrow. All we have to do is fly our F-115s home from Saudi Arabia and use them to guard Washington, D.C. and Peoria instead of Rodiah. Riyadh. Uh, Saudi Arabia. Let me read that again. We could also have real air defense against bombs or drones tomorrow. All we have to do is fly our F-15s home from Saudi Arabia and use them to guard Washington, D.C. and Peoria instead of Riyadh. Our Patriot missiles could be placed around city, U.S. cities instead of scattered around the United instead of scattered around the Middle East. Those who doubt the Patriot missiles' effectiveness could note that it has confirmed kills in 2003 against the RAF Tornado and F-18 Hornet by accident, <laughs> of course. But there's no doubt they can shoot down planes. If our Navy wasn't so busy blockading Iran to raise the price of oil, it could also add its Aegis Crusaders to defend our coastal cities. Our naval forces could still fight piracy and maintain freedom of the seas, and we don't need Cold War-sized forces in expensive Bahrain bases for that, as far as pirates go. All we really have to do is allow the merchantmen to arm themselves. Ooh, this guy knows what's going on. Of course, if we applied non-interventionist foreign policy, the number of groups motivated to attack us would be greatly reduced. Right now, we are involved in the most of the ethnic and religious conflicts around the world. Far too many political factions would benefit from a distracted and damaged United States. If the attack were anonymous, how could we retaliate? Last time we retaliated against a nation, Iraq, that wasn't even involved in the attack. They didn't even have the VMDs, but what if our next president accidentally lies to us in attacking someone who does, like France? This brings up another Swiss policy. Their president can't launch wars by executive order. In theory, neither can ours, but we need to start applying that theory and the rest of the rule of law in practice again. The Swiss recipe for peace is simple, but it requires all elements in order to work. Number one, power must be decentralized decentralized so that our own politicians cannot aggress against other na other nations. It's too obvious to need stating, but you cannot stay out of wars if you keep starting them. Number two, defense must be decentralized as well. The Norwegians also had a militia system in World War II, but the weapons were piled in central armories. The Wittishmott paratroopers dropped right on the armories and used the Norwegians' own artillery against them. Number three, Defense must be focused on defense and protection of civil, civil society. Adding your troops to every ethnic and religious conflict on earth is not going to make your society safer. Refusing to face the real threat, bankruptcy and monetary collapse. Our national defense debate is taking place in media wonderland, where the United States has indefinite resources and there are no costs or con consequences for any action. According to Newt, it's time, Newt Gingrich, it's time for us to spend a few trillion on a government-run moon base, on a government-run moon base, while Mitt wants, Mitt Romney just wants to spend those trillions on new Middle East wars. These are supposedly the mainstream views, and only non, the only non-interventionist candidate is summarily ignored. Back on planet Earth, the United States has on budget debt that is larger than our GDP. A government accounts accountants don't count Social Security, Medicare, prescription drug benefit, the Federal Reserve bank bailouts, Professor Lawrence Kolokoff using CBO figures, calculating the real US debt at more than two hundred trillion two hundred trillion. Our huge defense budget is borrowed month by month by foreign powers. Hardly sustainable situation. If we eliminate corporate welfare and bailouts, get out of illegal undeclared wars, reduce and redirect military spending to actual defense, and f free the U.S. economy to recover, 
the 21st century could see an American Renaissance. Otherwise, our economy's fall is inevitable, and all kings' tanks and all the kings' planes won't put it back together again. An America involved in every conflict with no resources to support any of them is a legacy we have given our children. Wow. That's from uh, Bill Walker, entitled How the Swiss Opted Out of War. He is a very wise man and knows his shit. Uh, I'd like to interview the guy one day, hopefully. It'd be kind of cool. He uh, kind of has my same ideas of a hard war uh, and staying out of other people's shit. And if they try to fuck you up, you destroy them entirely and blow up their entire civilization. I like that idea. It's kind of cool. Instead of invol involving yourself in every random little civil war, why don't you just, you know, do the Switzerland thing? I mean, their entire population is essentially a, a ginormous SF uh, but I'd uh, be larger than the battalion be like an entire crusade <laughs> you don't want to fuck with Switzerland they'll, they'll screw you up that's why they've never been attacked although I, 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 I'll put it in the show notes I, uh, I did I was actually very impressed they had like 30 or 40 different people um, in Afghanistan and they ended up leaving which I thought was kind of cool um I was really impressed by that. I mean, I'm not 100% how many people died of the Swiss uh, military in Afghanistan. But even if any of them have been injured or anything, it's just complete farce. I'm not exactly sure even how they um, got there or why. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, that's just total BS they don't need to be involving themselves in. If they want, in our next story, they should have just, you know, allowed people to go to Triple Canopy and uh, go to Afghanistan. That's totally fine. But, you know, involving their their military in it that's just not respectable especially since they're conscripted that's not cool at all um from pr newswire triple canopy forms an employee-owned company reston virginia february 14th pr newswire triple canopy incorporated a global provider for mission support security training and advisory services is pleased to announce they have formed a 100 percent employee-owned company by establishing an employee stock ownership plan a veteran-owned and veteran-owned company, more than 80% of Triple Canopy's workforce is made of former military personnel. This is an exciting time for Triple Canopy, and we are proud to become a majority veteran, employee-owned company, said Triple Canopy CEO Ignacio Balderas, delivering quality services to governments and multinational companies in challenging locations remains the mainstay of our business success. Triple Canopy's new employee stock ownership plan, retirement structure, will enable employees to share in its company's growth and success by earning shares in the business, according to Balderas. Building an ownership culture with our newly established ESOP will strengthen our employee base and enhance retention of experienced personnel worldwide. I cannot think of a better way to drive quality across our organization than to give employee ownership to the company and let them directly participate in its growth and success. An employee stock ownership plan is a retirement plan that enables employees to own the company where they work through a qualified trust. First established in 1974, there are approximately 11,500 ESOP businesses in the United States with over 10 million employee owners. About Triple Canopy. Triple Canopy is a leading provider of mission support, training, security, advisory services. I don't even read that. It's just, yeah. So, all you Triple Canopy guys out there, get in some ESOP. Start investing. Throw down dollar, dollar bills, y'all. Dollar, dollar bills. Dollar, dollar bills. Yeah, I'm kind of running the weather today. I've kind of worked out too hard. I have to split up my, uh, my running and my leg work. Focusing on uh, bodybuilding has been kind of difficult. Uh, if there's not a lot of drugs, my immune system can't really do as much as I'd like it to. <laughs> so I, but I did get up to like 9.3. There was a 9.5 miles an hour uh, sprints. That was kind of cool. Uh, although I couldn't walk for a day, but, you know, hey. This is pretty cool from the reason.com. Uh, reason 
Uh, if you're not familiar, Reason.com is a, uh, they're part of the Reason Foundation, which is a libertarian think tank. They've got videos, they've got articles, they've got all kinds of stuff. And they uh, kind of pride themselves on being uh, directly in the middle of libertarian thought. Um, so one day you might see a socialist republic or socialist libertarian kind of piece, and then the next day you might see a you know very uh, right wing kind of uh, style of libertarianism. So you have the different viewpoints, and it's interesting because all of us libertarians don't exactly have the same viewpoints on things. Um, the lethal legacy of U.S. intervention. The deadly consequences and culpability continue long after the last soldier leaves. Americans seem to believe that once the U.S. military exits a foreign country, its moral accountability ends, but the deadly consequences and culpability continue long after the last soldier leaves. Take Iraq, which the U.S. military left at the end of 2011, though not before President Obama pleaded with the Iraqi government to let some American forces remain, violence is flaring in Iraq. As Sunni Muslims fled, Fed up with the oppressive, corrupt, U.S.-installed, and Iran-leading Shia government have mounted new resistance. Not our responsibility, most Americans would think. The U.S. troops are long gone, so our hands are clean. Not so fast, said University of San Francisco Middle East scholar Stefan Zunes. The tragic upsurge of violence in Iraq in recent months, including the temporary takeover of sections of the two major Iraqi cities by Al-Qaeda affiliates, Zuni writes. It's a direct consequence of the repression of peaceful dissident by the U.S. dissent by the U.S.-backed government in Baghdad, and ultimately of the 2003 U.S. invasion and occupation. He goes on, The U.S.-backed Iraqi regime is dominated by sectarian and Shia Muslim parties which have discriminated against the Sunni Muslim majority. The combination of government repression and armed insurgency resulted in the deaths of nearly 8,000 civilians last year alone. But the, U but the United States... But can the United States really be responsible? Wasn't Iraq a terrible place before 2003? Yeah. Invasion. Devastation. Occupation. Iraq was centrally ruled by a bad man by a bad man, I think he meant madman, Saddam Hussein, who repressed the majority Shia, but also mistreated Sunnis. Yet Iraq was not plagued by sectarian violence before the U.S. military arrived. Until the 2003 U.S. invasion and occupation, Iraq had maintained a long-standing history of secularism and long national identity among its Arab population, despite sectarian differences, Sunnis writes. Not only did the U.S. invasion and occupation fail to bring a functional democracy to Iraq, neither U.S. forces nor the success of U.S.-backed Iraqi governments have been able to provide the Iraqi people with basic security. This has led many ordinary citizens to turn to armed security militias for protection. Zunes notes that much of Iraq's divisions can be traced to the decision of the U.S. occupation authorities immediately following the conquest to abol abolish the Iraqi army and purge the government bureaucracy, both bastions of secularism and national identity, thereby creating a vacuum that was soon filled by sectarian parties and militias. So once again, arrogant American policymakers lumbered into, for, lumbered into a foreign country thinking they could remake it in their own image, apparently without knowing anything about the cultural or social context. This is hardly the first time, which is why Eugene Burdick and William Leader's 1958 novel, The Ugly American, still packs so much power. Horrific as the Iraq story is, consider what's happening today in Laos and southeast China. The U.S. military bombed Laos in 1964 to 1973 during its war on Vietnam to disrupt the Ho Chi Minh trial. Trail. Trial? Trail. The route for military personnel and equipment from North Vietnam to South Vietnam, which ran through Laos and Cambodia, according to the website Legacies of War. The U.S. dropped over 2 million tons of ordnance over Laos and 508,000 bombing missions, 
the equivalent of one plane load every eight minutes, 24 hours a day, for nine years. That would have been bad enough, but the U.S. government dropped cluster bombs, which are made up of so many of so-called bomblets, about 30% of which did not explode immediately. At least 270 million cluster bomblets were dropped as part of the bombing campaign. Approximately 80 million failed to detonate. Data from the survey completed in last 2009 indicate the UXO, Unexplosive Ordnance, including cluster bombs, have killed or maimed as many as 50,000 civilians in Laos since 1964 and 20,000 since 1973 after the war ended. Over the past two years, there have been over 100 new casualties each year. About 60% of accidents result in death, and 40% of the victims are children. Boys are particularly at risk. Thus, 40 years after America's war of aggression against the people of Southeast Asia, American musician, uh, munitions continue to kill people. Remember this the next time you hear anti-war advocates smeared as isolationists and American foreign intervention lauded as a blessing to mankind. Wow. That's from Sheldon Richman, The Lethal Legacy of U.S. Intervention. The deadly consequences and culpability continue long after the last soldier leaves. It's hard to read. It's so true. That's my, uh, it's kind of like what I found in the, in the news today, kind of give you different ideas and things on uh, what's going on with the military and uh, different, uh, different ideas, different, you know, places you might kind of gather uh, to f- make your own viewpoints. Um, I want to give shout outs to my uh, buddy who uh, went on his vacation back to the States this week and uh, about two weeks ago and I ended up back, uh, back in Afghanistan. I, he knows who he is. Uh, hope he's getting some good pizza. We got a fantastic pizza place at this one base. The best pizza you could ever have in your entire life. Thank God for the Italians and their awesome pizza-ness. Um, this episode's been filmed or uh, been recorded on my new Tascam DR100 MK2, which hopefully the audio has been a little bit better for you guys. Um, this episode will probably just be in, in a complete audio file thrown up on YouTube with a couple of pictures. So just easy stuff I can get out real quick. Um, hope you guys have enjoyed and uh, please subscribe to us on uh, YouTube. Um, this has been Death Metal Chronicles episode number 12. And I uh, hope you guys have a great hump day and to hump to all of you.